أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Alhamdulillah, we've got our regulars, I know. MashaAllah, who are here every week. So thank you to our regulars. And if you are here for the first time, welcome. Um, this is our, I believe, eighth uh, webinar in the series. And uh, inshallah, we'll be carrying on every week over the next um, at least another month or four to six weeks, uh, inshallah. So thank you so much to everyone for joining us. We've got around 50 or 50 or 60 people in the room so far. So that's a good number to start uh, on, inshallah. And uh, so uh, let me introduce our speaker for today. And we're very fortunate to have Sister Dr. Farah Ahmed with us here, who is going to be delivering today's webinar all about understanding education in light of Hadith Jibra'il. Dr. Farah Ahmed is the Lever Hume Early Career Research Fellow at the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Farah has published widely on holistic Islamic ed educational approaches and is founder and director of education at the Islamic Shaksia Foundation, where she works on developing research-informed curricular resources and teacher professional development. She is also founding fellow and council member of the Chartered College of Teaching. Um, now, uh, of course, this, this webinar, uh, and it is a webinar, uh, rather than a workshop, includes a presentation uh, by Dr. Farah Ahmed, uh, which will be approximately half an hour, inshallah, and then you will have an opportunity to ask uh, questions. So the virtual audience, that's you, uh, will have an opportunity to ask questions, uh, inshallah. And you can do that by either raising your hand. Um, I do prefer verbal questions, or if you want to write in the chat box the word speak, S-P-E-A-K, uh, and then I will, inshallah, come over to you and uh, we will give you an opportunity to talk. You can also write your questions, but please be warned, I'm going to give preference to those who, uh, you, know, uh, rate, you know, verbally ask their uh, questions. And we don't, have a, we don't have a huge amount of time, but about 15, 20 minutes at most. We are going to try and end on time. We always try and end on time. Um, so just after five o'clock, we will be ending, uh, inshallah. Okay, so uh, thank you again to everyone. That number is creeping up to 73, alhamdulillah. So let's make a start, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum to um, Sister Farah. Let me uh, put the video over to you. And I know you're going to bring up your, your slides as well, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Farah. Uh, wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam. Okay. Uh, okay. First of all, thank you for joining us. Um, and I know you're a very busy person delivering your sort of other webinars as well. And I know you've been unwell recently. So Allah grant you shifa, inshallah. And thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I know it's going to be very thought provoking. And as always, these webinars leave my head buzzing. You know, as, as the chair, I tend to kind of have a very close listening to every word. And I'm sure we'll all benefit, um, inshallah. And you could point us in the direct direction of where else we can continue our study. And as I, said before the purpose of these webinars is that we're trying to um, uh, educate our teachers a little bit more teachers who work in muslim schools so it's great to be good at assessment for learning and behavior for learning and how to plan an outstanding lesson but i think we've got such a rich heritage there's so much um, uh, knowledge that we still need to learn as practice as practi practitioners and academics such as yourself self inshallah we can learn so much from you so thank you again Thank you again for um, joining us, inshallah. So over, over to you. Okay, Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Salatu salam. Sayyidu Muhammad wa Ali Sahabi Ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, everybody. Jazakallah khair for joining us. Inshallah, I'm going to just share my screen so you can see my slides. Uh, okay, so hopefully you should be able to see the slides now. Yep. Okay, so Rahman Rahim. So um, I just want to start off by... Okay, so can you, oh, there it is. Okay, right, that way. By offering some context to what I'm going to do today. So mostly I'm known, people who know me, for um, talking about Shabsi Islamia and breaking that down and talking about dialogic halakha and how dialogic halakha can develop Shabsi Islamia. That's what my PhD was about. Um, I'm primarily an educator. That's how I see myself. I'm a practitioner. I still work in schools. 
I, I do academic work, but it's inspired by and it feeds into Shaksia school. So it's quite specific to the work that we do and the ideas that, that those ideas can be translated into other um, types of settings as well. The reason I'm saying that is because what I'm going to be discussing today is seems very theoretical, but it's very hard in half an hour to give the theory and talk about the practice. Um, so I'm just presenting some foundational ideas here. And what I will say is that uh, during Ramadan, we did a series of four seminars, which are available on Facebook, which are kind of unpack this introductory webinar that we're doing now. Um, I also want to say this is not a scholarly commentary on Hadith Jabril. I don't count myself in any way as an alim or a, a scholar. It's rather, it's just a reading as an educator and um, I'm open to feedback. In fact, I would very much welcome feedback from people who have uh, more knowledgeable than me on, on Hadith studies. Okay, so this is So Hadith Jabril, um, it's, it, it kind of encapsulates something that I talk about as two beginnings. Um, if we think about the narratives of the human story in the Quran, we have these two beginnings of the creation of Adam alayhi salam, where Adam alayhi salam is directly taught the names of things by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that in itself is a, another sort of event, um, Quranic event, which can really be is so much in there in terms of our education. But I think it's significant because what I'm going to say is that the second beginning is when revelation comes to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is the beginning of Islam as we know it. And we are all very familiar with others, uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being instructed to Ikra bi ismi rabbi kalladhi khalaq. You know, to read or recite in the name of your Rabb who created you. Okay. And this, what we're talking about today, again, that event, there's so much to unpack in there as education. But what we're talking about today is the, the kind of, I suppose, the, the um, protagonists of this event. We're talking about Jibreel salam, and Muhammad salam, and the relationship that is between them as educators. Jibreel, we know, is the messenger to the messenger. Okay, so the message of Allah comes from, from Allah to Rasulullah through this messenger, through this um, other form of Rasul um, of Jibreel. And this relationship that Jibril has with the Prophet ﷺ for 23 years of our earthly time is an educational relationship in some, some ways. And so one of the ways of understanding that is to look at the Hadith Jibril, which is a very famous Hadith, and there's a, um, it's quite lengthy. Um, I'm just going to read out the text of it in English. So Umar bin al-Khattab reported that one day when we were with Allah's messenger, a man with very, very white clothing and very black hair came up to us. No mark of travel was visible on him and none of us recognized him. Sitting down before the Prophet, leaning his knees against his, um, apologies, I'm just finding it hard to kick, to, yeah, okay. Um, none of us recognized him. Sitting down before the Prophet, leaning his knees against his and placing his hands on his own thighs, he said, tell me, Muhammad, about Islam. The Prophet replied, Islam means that you should bear witness that there is no God but Allah, that Muhammad is Allah's messenger, that you should perform the ritual prayer, pay the alms tax, fast during Ramadan, and make the pilgrimage to the house if you are able to go there. The man said, you have spoken the truth. We were surprised at his questioning him and then declaring that he had spoken the truth. The man said, now tell me about Iman. The prophet replied, Iman means that you affirm belief in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers in the last day, and that you affirm the decree, the good of it and the bad of it. Remarking that he had spoken the truth, the man then said, now tell me about Ihsan. The prophet replied, Ihsan means that you should worship Allah as if you see him. Or even if you do not see him, he sees you. And the hadith continues. Then the man said, tell me about the hour. The prophet replied, about that, he who is questioned knows no more than the questioner. The man said, then tell me about its marks. The prophet said, the slave girl will give birth to her mistress and you will see the barefoot, the naked, the destitute, and the shepherds vying with each other in building. Then the man went away. After I had waited for a long time, the prophet said to me, do you know who the questioner was, Umar? I replied, Allah and his messenger know best. He said he was Jibra'il. He came to teach you your deen, your way of life. 
there's no way of doing justice to this hadith in, in, in half an hour, okay? It, there's, people have written volumes on this it, because the hadith, people, uh, some of the ulama have argued, encompasses an overall understanding of deen and it provides a concise definition, but within that definition is a very deep understanding what we can, what our deen, our way of life is. So it's laden with layers of meaning and it provides a blueprint for an Islamic worldview, i.e. deen. And, but what I'm interested in is, is, a, is the educational side of it. So the relationship of Jibreel uh, with Muhammad sallallahu and the Prophet responding to questions from an educator as opposed to acting as an educator himself, which is a very unique example in the Hadith. And as Nadeem Maman has said, this Hadith illuminates how to teach and what to teach. So it provides guidance for pedagogy as well as curricula, which I think is very significant. So pedagogy in Hadith Jibreel. So there's a number of characteristics of this exchange between Jibreel as an educator and the Prophet Sallallahu in this instance as a learner. First, Jibreel clearly has a sense of purpose which comes through in the description of how he sits in front of the Prophet and commands the Prophet's attention. So we, you know, we have this description of Jibreel coming and sitting in front of him with his, in, in a position where he places his hands on his own knees and the Prophet is he's directly facing him. And there's this, you know, very intense sort of one-to-one um, -one in engagement between, with, between Jibreel and the Prophet. And this teaching is clearly a moment of connection between these two different beings. He's effectively assessing the Prophet's knowledge. It's almost an evaluative in, encounter. And knowledge and understanding, and simultaneously, so you've got this going on on one hand, but at the same time, the companions who are present are being educated through this encounter. So it's almost like a modeling. You know, if you think of a classroom situation where you talk to one, one student and you're engaging that student and you, what you're doing in that action is modeling mm -hmm. for other students what they need to learn. Secondly, he's effectively, um, sorry, he does this through this dialogic exchange. And although the exchange is just this question and answer, and it doesn't have the kind of deliberative shared thinking that's a characteristic of um, a high quality dialogue, is nonetheless this very meaningful exchange between the educator and the educated. And there's, it's built upon this existing relationship of mutual respect. And so this role modeling that we see in this hadith it, it is very powerful and it should give us much to re reflect upon in how we engage with our, what our relationship is with our students, with our people that we're teaching, and how those relationships um, should, it should be, the, the mutual respect in particular, in what ways that mutual respect is going, it, it could, you know, could be sort of realized in, in our own work. Okay, so another significant point about this hadith is the Prophet's very clear recognition of the limitations of human knowledge and understanding. And this is very significant because we live in an age where this isn't, this isn't prevalent. Um, so the acknowledgement that he, when the Prophet says, he who is questioned knows no more than the question. Okay. He doesn't feel the need to say, it's something I don't know, are you going to tell me? I something I need to find out. He just simply says, he who is questioned knows no more than the questioner. He, he accepts this. And this, need, this, feel, this sort of like acceptance of not needing to know the answer of this particular question doesn't seem to bother the prophet and doesn't bother Jibreel. They're both in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're both sort of understanding their sphere, understanding what their role is and you know where they need to what they need to know, what they don't, what, you know, what knowledge is not significant for them. And so this example of the Prophet here, it reorients our approach to knowledge to be one of humility. In recognizing the limitations of our knowledge, we need to be aware that our knowledge is always incomplete and we should be tentative in our conclusions. And not just as learners, but as educators as well. <coughs> Excuse me, so... So this, this is a very different approach to how, you know, we kind of say to kids, you have to know, this is the right answer and you must get to the right answer. And this is what, that's the approach we have to educate education. But this approach this is that sometimes it's a bit, it's knowing something to know that you don't know something. Okay. And I think that's something that is, comes, stands out from this hadith. 
he has this very surprising nature, it's very specific of pedagogical style, but there's more educational significance in the foundational concepts that are being taught, if you like, in, in the Hadith. So the four foundational concepts, um, which have an educational quality, um, and they give us an understanding both of the purpose, the mode, and the practice of education. So each of these will speak to aims and objectives, modes, forms of education, and practice. And the key concepts are deen, iman, islam, and ihsan. And they directly relate to the outcome of education, i.e. what is the fulfillment of human potentiality, okay? So I think last week, uh, I'm sure Dr. Shaheen would have talked about um, the notion of fitra and how the potential that is there in the human being. I can talk a little bit more about that, but I'm assuming you have some understanding of that. So this, this notion of human potentiality and then the process of education that facilitates that potentiality. And these concepts are embodied in, so these concepts of deen, iman, islam, and ihsan, what, what I'm arguing here, are embodied in individual Muslims, but they're also embodied in the relationality, the relationships that exist within Muslim communities in a number of ways. And, and both at the level of the individual and at the level of community, at the level of the relationality, is there are educational processes um, at, at work. Okay, so... To understand um, these key concepts, if, to begin to, with the concept of deen and understand that as a holistic way of life built upon Tawheed. And we're going to look at the worldview of Iman, could be translated as belief, faith, conviction, as bearing witness to and recognizing Allah in every thought, every word, and every action. And the practice of Islam as submission to the will of Allah through acting according to his Sharia, which is a means towards deen a holistic way of life. It's not just a legal code, it's a way of life. And through an understanding of the purpose of life and thereby education to be attaining, attaining ihsan, sublime and beautiful moral excellence through this strong ongoing relationship with Allah. I'm going to unpack this a little bit now. Okay, so the concluding sentence of the Hadith, the, um, the Prophet says, he tells Umar that he came to teach you your deen. And which indicates that the deen can be understood as the drawing together of Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. And in this sense, the meaning of deen is understood to be multi-layered, yet its central tenet of Tawheed holds all these layers of meaning in synchronization. So deen and Islam begins by asserting Tawheed, the holism, the oneness or unity of Allah, and extending this to the unity of creation, unity of ilm knowledge, unity and therefore equality of humanity, unity of those who have testified and submitted as Muslims, unity of the deen, the Islamic way of life, and the unity of every other concept and human endeavor that exists within Islamic culture. Our culture is a culture of Tawheed. Tawheed permeates our culture at every level. And yet, as Professor Rajab has indicated, um, and not, not in the seminar he gave for Nidha, but he's written uh, in, in his inaugural lecture at Ibn Khaldun University, he talks about multiplexity, that there are multiple objects, persons, or ways in, in Islam, and there's multiple relationships between concepts and persons and ways of knowing. And so within the deen, there is the capacity for it to, op, op, to work in all sorts of different ways. And in, in one of the um, webinars that's available on Facebook, I, I, I sort of unpack how all the different range of Islamic cultures are to be found in this one deen. And so it comes to different regions and cultures and times and between different people. Um, and this understands how this understanding explains how Islam is, is so multifarious, right? But it's still yet so unified. It's still very much something that you can recognize. It doesn't fall apart when it when it when there you know there are still often differences within it. So what does this unity and multiplexity have to say about how we reorient ourselves to teaching and learning Islam? Okay, so it's essential as educators we have this deep deep understanding of this term deen. Okay, so what I'm trying to get, gain here, sort of get at here is that as educators, these four concepts of deen, iman, islam, ihsan are fundamental mm -hmm. in us understanding what, what Islam is, but then also what education is in relation to Islam. Okay, and so if it's an organ composing way of life and it's not just related to the five pillars, this creates a worldview which is very distinct and contrary to the worldview view that we function within at the moment, that way our education system and our, and our schools function, which is modernity, right? Um, 
what does this mean for teaching and learning to always be from an Islamic worldview? Okay, so how, how does that un, impact? So, you know, this is something that's been discussed in the Muslim world since about the 1960s, 70s. And you had various movements. You had the Islamization of knowledge movement. You now have this integrated education discourse. I, I actually like an approach that Sister Fatma Doyen, who is an educator, um, takes, where she just talks about holistic Islamic education. And this involves a reworking of classical Islamic educational thought, which synthesizes classical Islamic pedagogy with contemporary educational methods. Okay, so what you're, we're doing here is looking at education holistically but looking at education as always to do with islam so that you don't have islamic studies or darul loom over there or madrasas or maktabs and then you have your full-time schooling but you have an integration between the two and there's a few projects that um have, have sort of done this in different ways um sister fatma doyan herself she's done various projects of taking neoclassical approaches montessori approaches and you know she's done about four or five in her life and tried different things out, and there's a lot of learning from those projects. So you have the Tarbiya project, uh, and which provides this integrated learning model, which Dawood Tawhidi um, put together in 2001. You have something called Concentric Circles by Al Mahada, and you have the principles of Shakhsi education, um, which you know is uh, what we do in, in our schools. And what these approaches they attempt to do is provide this holistic interdisciplinary education from an Islamic worldview. Okay, now coming on to um, pedagogy, so that, uh, moving on from Dean, I want to look at these three terms of Iman, Islam and Ihsan, and what, 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 the way I'm reading them is I, I feel there's a relationship between these terms and Tarbiyah, Ta'lim and Ta'adib, okay, which are the Islamic terms for education. And on top of this, there are relationships with body, mind and spirit, so there's an ontological, epistemological and axiological dimension to, to this hadith, which I think is, is, is very significant. Don't worry if you don't understand these big words. They're essentially to do with being and knowing and values, mor morality. That's essentially what we're talking about. But they, all of these things, as to what we understand as existence, what we understand it is to be, what we understand knowledge to be, what we understand values and morality to be, all these things are really significant for how we educate. Um, I'm covering a lot here. As I said, I'm just trying to give an overview. Uh, and, you know, I don't have time to imp to sort of, um, you know, break it all down. But if we look at this as, a, you know, these, these three kind of areas in the Hadith, so in terms of what exists, what it is to be, you have this notion of the body of the fitra and Iman and Tarbiya, okay? okay? In terms of not knowledge, what it is to know, you have the Akal, you have the cognitive mind, you have Islam, the knowledge of Islam and Ta'aleem. And then you, in terms of the morality and spiritual dimension of the human being, um, you have uh, nafs and ruh, ihsan, and you have notions of ta'adib and tazkiyah. So there's lots and lots of different things. As I said, the hadith is, is considered to be a foundational hadith, and there's so much in it. Okay, so to sort of break that down a little bit more, iman and tarbiya. Tarbiya means to cause something to develop from stage to stage until reaching its full completion and this full potential, and this uh, is taken from the classical lexicographer, Raghib Asfahani. It's connected to this concept of fitra, so that we have a human nature which is inclined towards recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that the notion is that the fitra can, in, if, if the fitra is actualized, we can have this flourishing human life. And at the root of this human flourishing is iman. Okay, so the, the way that the tarbiya the nurturing will happen of the fitra is through iman. And this firm conviction in Allah as al, as, uh, al ahad al-Khaliq, and Rabbul Alameen is, is what this conviction in, is what genera is, is, is generates an, uh, iman, and this is how tarbiya is, can, can be done, by developing this conviction, okay? So tarbiya is intimately intertwined with nurturing and nourishing this iman through a recognition of Allah as one, as creator and as lord of all the worlds. And this relationship with Allah as Rabb, Rabb meaning a guardian lord, one who educates, one who does the tarbiya. And this understanding that as human beings, Allah is the education that the Prophet ﷺ receives through Jibreel and he calls out on Allah as his Rabb. This is something that extends to all of us, okay? So that through the Prophet, we are also being taught by Allah SWT and our tarbiyah comes through the Quran, it comes through the Hadith, it comes through learning Islam. But as murabbi, as those who engage in tarbiyah, iman and its development of iman is something that we are consistently sort of 
working to to uh, nurture. And this is the other significant point is that this has to be done in a personalized way, okay? Because every individual child is unique. There is no model of therapia, right? You can't just say, if you do this, this, and this, and this, you've done therapia. Here's a checklist. Here's a standard operating procedure, okay? That doesn't work. And the reason that doesn't work is because that approach is a mechanistic approach. And that mechanistic approach comes from the European concept of modernity, which came through the Enlightenment, which basically sees creation, what exists, as some sort of big, big, huge machine, okay? So that if you can understand all the different parts of everything that exists in the world, then you can understand the world. And the way to do that is to set up these standards and to set up these mechanisms and to set up structures. That's the opposite of therapia. Therapia is you start with this unique human being, with this unique fitra. All of, each and every unique fitra will, rec, will be towards, inclined towards recognizing Allah, but they will all be different. And you take that and you nurture it, and you, you develop and build and educate that to flourish to its potential, that specific individual. Okay? And therefore, your, what you... We, you as an educator need to have, to, uh, to have an understanding of is a broad understanding of the deen, a broad understanding of what it means to be a, a Muslim, what it means to be a mu'min, what it means to be Muslim, what it means to have shaksi islamia, and to be able to apply that to this specific individual. Okay? And that's very, very skillful and takes a lot of experience and a lot of hikmah. But at, funnily enough, at, at, when you come to a primary age, you see mums who have very basic understanding of Islam, they have this. They know that the way that they bring up Dul, Abdullah is very different to the way they bring up, um, you know, Hassan, because Abdullah and Hassan are different. So this is something that can work in all sorts of different levels and layers, but this, this is, Tarbiya and Iman have this sort of innate connection. Okay, so for example, understand that Allah is al-Khaliq can be through recognizing that all that is observed and verified in the physical sciences has been created by Allah. So that's one way. And that this creation follows specific patterns observable to human beings through mathematics. Okay. But that mathematics isn't the be all and end all. Okay. So not the entire world isn't just maths driven. That the human being has been given this natural tendency to look for patterns by Allah. This is very something very specific that we are programmed to see patterns. And this, as human beings, programming sort of enables us to see the ayat of Allah, the signs of Allah in his creation. And this capacity is also to be created through art and design. And this, that capacity of, you know, has also been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is ultimately only meaningful. Art and design are creativity, all the things that we can do, that this amazing, um, that, uh, you know, different things that we're able to do as human beings. They're only meaningful when they're used to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is, these are all forms of tarbiyah. Okay, so just checking the time. Yep, I thought I'm very behind. So tarbiyah is highly dependent on the intuition, spirituality and sensitivity of the teacher towards the learner in her care. And she must have a very deep reflective understanding of this learner and the skill to connect the learner. And I'm going to just skip on because... I want to get onto Dalim and Dadib a little bit. So Dalim is commonly translated as education or teaching, translations that imply that it's the transmission or inculcation of ilm. And one thing is that, you know, obviously we're used to this notion in, in our tradition of the Isnad of transmission, okay? But what I'm saying doesn't take away from that. Transmission is still very much part of our tradition. But Dalim is also includes knowledge acquired through the senses, through inductive and deductive reasoning, aqli, and also, obviously, the Nakli, the Quran, and the Sunnah. But it's well understood that this transmission of knowledge must necessarily transform the being, the understanding, and the actions of the human being. Okay? And that this is something very specific. So, the, we're not, this is not just knowledge as information. This is not just knowledge that you have and then you carry it like, you know, like your bank, um, as, uh, as people have said in the past. But this is knowledge that transforms you, that changes you, and leads to the attainment of Islam. Islam means submission. Okay, so ilm, ta'aleem, leads to this, to this submission. Okay, um, 
Now, according to Hadith Jibreel, submission and thereby Islam comes into being in the human being through this, the practice of Arqan al-Islam. Because if we remember the Hadith, the, the Prophet, when answering the question, what is Islam, he gives the Arqan, he gives the five pillars of action. And Islam is taught not through um, imparting, I think, but okay, so for example, if we talk about the act of Shahada as a physical, physical utterance of the Shahadatain, right? And they're two formulaic sentences, uh, um, ultimately. But when they uttered, they constitute an action and a concrete embodiment of, um, not, oh, sorry, I'm just finding it hard to sort of see my full screen, embodiment of knowledge. This action transforms the being of a human being from a non-believer to a Muslim and brings him into a new plane of existence and embodiment. His cognitive worldview changes and he now knows and bears witness to these two universal truths. So the Shahadatain is a form of ilm transforming into action, okay? And that acknowledgement of Allah as, 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 the, as the one and Muhammad as the messenger of Allah is this notion of ta'aleem which is becoming something that is impacting the, the being of the, of, of the Muslim but is leading you to submission. And this also works in terms of salah, um, and uh, zakat and so on, okay? And it also goes beyond the arkan of Islam, right? So it's not just limited to, to the arkan, um, because obviously ta'aleem is not just to do with the, the five pillars. Okay, so I, I could give the example of, of the other ones that are being arazak and what that would mean in terms of um, learning and ta'aleem. But just to move very quickly on to ihsan and ta'adib. So ihsan is the beautification, perfection or excellence. It comes from the root word husn, meaning beauty. And it's a matter of taking one's inner faith and iman and showing it in both deed and action. But it's, there's also a layer of social responsibility born on religious convictions that um, uh, can be unpacked in terms of this notion of ihsan. So ihsan is the Muslim's responsibility to obtain perfection or excellence in worship, such that we worship Allah as if we see him. And although we cannot see him, we undoubtedly believe that he sees us. And there's the definition given in the Jihadith Jibreel. This is the answer that the Prophet ﷺ gives when um, he's asked so that we worship Allah as if we see him. That means not just in our salah, but in every moment of our lives, that we, our engagement with Allah is as if Allah is watching us and that we are responding to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's this relationship between us and Allah. So Thadid translates as refinement of character through education, okay? So it, it's, it's a, it can also be, have notions of disciplining, okay? And that's why some people, they don't like the term Thadid because they feel that it's to do with disciplining. But actually, I think that that's, uh, for me, it's a misreading, it's a misunderstanding of what we mean by the adab and what we mean by the discipline because there's a freedom that comes through this disciplining, okay? This is not a punishment, this is not a, trying to constrain um, uh, the individual, but the, rather what this is, is an, an, a disciplining of the nafs so that the lower nafs, so that the higher nafs can rise and so that the, there's an agency that, that comes which enables the human being to improve and to be better and to attain ihsan. So there's the inner dimensions of the individual shakhsiya, those pertain to the spiritual are essential to educating um, Muslims in you know, the approach that we take in Shaksi education. The young Muslim is nurtured to cultivate a very reflective personality and develop this ability to control and discipline the nafs in order to attain ihsan. And through that, the, the nafs is tamed, the heart is purified, and the personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala develops. So this notion of knowing that Allah is watching you and knowing that you worship Allah as if, as if he sees you or is, you know, is, is if you see him. This is a very important aspect of how we educate Muslims to be Muslims, okay? Mu'mins to be Mu'mins and uh, Muhsin to be Muhsin. It's, it's like it becomes something that is, needs to be interwoven in everything that we, we're doing. So the first thing is, is to nurture a sense of um, motivation, a sense of desire to attain Ihsan and to develop um, an understanding of how you attain ihsan. So this involves supporting children to become aware of their feelings and their desires. So sometimes we're not conscious of how our feelings and our desires impact us. Like something, for, for example, I think a lot of us may realize is that sometimes you don't realize that you're in pain. You know, you've got background pain going on and, you, and you're getting like irritable and da, 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 and you don't realize, and I, I don't know, this is my experience. And then you sit down and you suddenly realize, 
actually, you know what, I've got pain in my you know, head or here, and that's why I'm irritable. There's a lot of things going on in the background that we're not conscious of. But one of the things that we need to be doing is that we need to become much more conscious of ourselves, of what's happening with us, of our feelings and our desires. And there are ways of doing that with children. Part of teaching them their Islam that enables them then to see how Islam can help and support with that. And supporting the awareness of nurturing positive qualities through remembrance of Allah, through dhikr, through salah, developing. I mean, there's a hundred, you know, hundreds of ways of engaging in ta'zeeb, of, of trying to generate ihsan. I, you know, I really don't have time to go through that. But just to, I'm going to leave this slide to bring everybody back to this, is that there's this, the Hadith Jibreel is this amazing resource. And I really think, you know, somebody needs to write a huge book on Hadith Jibreel and education. But it, it, there's so many different layers to what the human being is and how the, the this encounter of Jibreel and Islam with the Prophet Sallallahu and what's happening there, the relationship, these concepts of deen, iman, Islam, ihsan, how we can draw from that in terms of tarbiyah, ta'aleem, ta'adeeb, how we can draw from that in terms of what the human being is and how we uh, um, educate this human being to be the best that they can be. Many, many things that I've touched on very, very, you know, at the surface, just sprinkled there. Inshallah, hopefully the, I'll be able to break that down a little bit more questions, but I've tried to, my best to stick to the time. Inshallah, I'll just stop there. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah right. khair. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sister Far. I think uh, you've stuck to the time, mashallah, better than anybody else, I think, uh, so far. So thank you so much. I know there's so much more that you wanted to say. Okay. So as I've said at the beginning, um, those of you that have just joined us, just to mention the method of uh, asking questions, please um, do so by either raising your hand or I think the better method is, this is where I can really pick it up quicker, is if you write the word speak, S-P-E-A-K, in the chat box, and then I, I will come to you. Of course, a lot of what Sister Farah has mentioned is what I think what some of you are saying is really deep. Okay, so therefore there needs to be some more questions, inshallah. And of course, it could never be covered all in one uh, hour, but the whole point is, is to spark curiosity so that there will be further study. And this is what we're trying to, we're trying to get teachers to do, is to read more, to study more, about all of these terms. If you've never heard any of these terms before, I hope you have, but if you've never heard any of these terms before, then really it's homework for the next, uh, from now until the next webinar. And if you have, and um, you know, you only know it gone on a superficial level, then again, more study. We need to keep on studying. This, this is an area which I think lots of us are working in Muslim schools. And even if you're not working in a Muslim school, you're a Muslim teacher working in sort of mainstream and other, other settings, wherever you may be, this is something we, we must uh, continue to build our knowledge uh, about, inshallah. Okay, we've got uh, uh, requests to ask questions flooding in. So let me, um, first of all, go to Brother Adnan, please. Okay, uh, Brother Adnan, I've unmuted you. What is your question or comment? Uh, uh, alaikum, sister. Uh, it's very nice to hear from you. Jazakallah uh, khair. My question is regarding in terms of the practical level. It's all good that uh, uh, in Islamic uh, Shaksiya Foundation, I think you're, you're saying that uh, there's basically one-to-one -one education model is prevailing and it is okay to criticize the modernity. Uh, but my understanding is in, if you look at the public state school, uh, I, I, this is one of the best system in a way that you can teach a number of students at one time. So what is the practical, your experience at a practical level, if we adopt this model, which you are suggesting, that's a one-to-one -one model, that would be very costly. And what is the practical significance and what is your personal experience on that? And what is the way forward on that? Thank you. Okay, um, I think it's a very important question. And I don't think I can answer it in, in two minutes. Um, I, the, what we do at Shuxia isn't just one-to-one -one teaching. We, ha we have groups of children. The maximum group size is 15. Um, but the, what we say to the teachers is that your primary task is to develop each individual Shuxia, each child. And your primary task is to develop a relationship with that child. And we give them mechanisms for, what, for what, how they do that, but then they also do a lot of teaching. What I firmly believe, and I've seen this happen, and also that's why I'm engaged in research, is to try and demonstrate that this isn't just me talking. 
is that when you develop children's shakhsiyah, their education transforms because they know why they're learning and they know what, what it's for. And they have a sense of um, learning to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also an excitement about it. So we have um, daily halakha sessions, which are a, a dialogic in the sense that we don't, we don't do Islamic studies. We have a halakha every day. And that's how they learn Islam, but they also learn about other religions. They learn about context, about what it means to be a Muslim in Britain through Halakha. And then the, the Halakha is at the core of the curriculum. So you've got these, um, a, a, a thematic curriculum that's built around it. And so then whatever is happening in Halakha, they will then sort of feed that into, you know, their, their, their English, their science, their art, and then they will bring it back in as well into Halakha. And what that does is it gives them a very sub, like they're learning for a purpose. And it's very different to the kind of national curriculum structures where actually you're, you may be right in the sense that in terms of mass schooling, then, you know, set up large school buildings and have this kind of factory type system where you're sort of, you know, educating children in batches, as Ken, Robin, Ken Robinson says, where they come in and you do this with them and they go out. Yes, that you could argue that, but you could equally argue that there's so many children who get lost in that system. OK, whether you're in the most developed or, the, you know, the, the richest countries or whether you're, whether you're in the, um, you know, the post-colonial countries, because I think that's the best way of, of, of describing them. How many children fall out of these systems and how many lives are sort of like, you know, I mean, I think I know people, lots of people personally who had such a terrible experience at school that, you know, they, they, they dropped out or they didn't complete it and so on. And that's impacted them for their lives because it is so much high stakes, um, what matters so much in terms of those qualifications and so on. What we're trying to um, talk about here is, is trying to rethink that. It's one, one thing I would say is that it was only about 100 years ago, maybe 200, between 100 and 200 years ago, that mass schooling begins. It begins in the late 19th century, okay? And it begins in Europe and it begins to serve to when Europe moves from an agrarian um, uh, economy to an industrialized economy. And now Europe is moving from an industrial economy into an information economy or a creative economy or a knowledge economy. OK, and the great educational minds in Europe are trying to work out. And it, everybody's saying it's only a matter of time that the current system is going to have to be dismantled because it just doesn't meet the needs of the new society or the needs of the new economy. So even for their own economy based motivations there's there's a rethinking that's happening what i'm saying is that if we you know we've been talking a lot about decolonizing the curriculum post colonialism and all this kind of stuff right um in the in you know in our broader discourse it, if as muslim educators we truly believe that islam has an answer for how we educate then we need to start having that conversation i don't say that i have all the answers but what I'm trying to do is try and unpack some of those ideas and engage in the conversation with other people who are doing that so that we can start rebuilding something and have something to offer, something to say, actually, we know the systems aren't working, but here's an alternative. And here's an alternative that isn't coming from the West. It's coming from Islam. So the other question I'd ask you is what happened before that 100 years, right? So Islam's been here for 1,400 years. What was going on educationally across the Muslim world for about the 12 to 1300 years before you had mass schooling? I'm not going to answer the question. I'm just going to ask it to try and raise this whole question about practicalities. Okay. Something must have been happening, something practical, which I would argue probably worked. You know, I, I met my grandmother who would have gone through that kind of approach and she was not educated, but she had knowledge and, um, Shaksia and she, she was educated in a very different kind of way. And when I look at her and I look at people who are educated now with degrees, you know, with professors, we need to think about what, what we think education is. Okay, Zakhalakha, thank you so much. Let's go straight to um, Haji Idris, Ustad Idris in South Africa. I'm going to unmute you now. Assalamu alaikum. Well, uh, assalamu alaikum. Uh, 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 Sister Farah is uh, always uh, a, a joy to listen to you. And one of the things I want to say to people that, you know, many of us, uh, we tend to do the same things the same way and believe there is no solution. I recall visiting your schools 
it was a very unique experience and I think it's important for all of us uh, to really bring back to our schools the true foundation of Islam, inshallah. And that will be really true education. Just a question to you, uh, Sister Farah. I mean, if, when you uh, hire educators or teachers to your school, and if you were to identify three attributes or qualities they need to possess, what would be those three qualities? I think that's a really, really important question. One of the things I firmly believe that education is simply about the teacher, okay? Um, you can have the best school in the world, the best curriculum in the world, the best everything. If the teacher is, you know, the teacher brings everything to it, okay? Um, so it's so important in trying to take on, when we're taking on teachers. The first thing I'd say is that I don't, um, we don't really look that much at qualifications. Obviously, teachers have to be educated to some degree, but we're not that interested in the teaching qualifications and so on. What we're looking for is, first of all, a, a sense of shakhsiya in themselves, which can be very varied. And we ask them those questions. But what does that mean? So we look for, I look for a sense of um, intellectual humility. So somebody who's willing to learn and somebody who's willing to then understand that you know their whole professional life is going to be a, a, a journey of learning and this is something that even in the state sector okay so I'm, i am involved in the state sector in, in some capacity that i'm involved with the chartered college of teaching which is the national professional body for the teachers in the uk and the, the ethos the reason I'm, I'm i'm part of that and i work with them is because they have that ethos they have that ethos that you you are always learning and the ceo of you know the chartered college who's a you know a dame and has been and so on she's a very significant public figure she's always learning so this whole notion of intellectual humility is really important to me the second notion is a commitment to educating the children to a commitment to having that relationship with the children so you, this is not about you know, a, a career progression or how much the salary is and anything like that, but it's commitment to children. So I would, I would definitely look for that. And the third thing I'd look for is somebody who's willing to, who's interested in doing that collaboratively. Okay. So who wants to do that as part of a team, isn't somebody who's looking to just, it's my classroom and uh, you know, nobody else is allowed in it, or this is how I do things, but it wants to do it as a team and wants to do that, build those relationships in schools at, at, um, uh, at that level as well. So I hope that's a short answer to your question because I'm sure there's many more questions, inshallah, but we can pick it up another time, Hajjad Reis, inshallah. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, let's move to the next question by Sister Aisha. This is a written question. Mm -hmm. Alama Iqbal has mentioned three levels of faith, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan and has built his philosophy of education around this concept. He suggests that the learner must receive education according to his particular level of faith. How do you perceive this? Um, uh, Sister Aisha knows that I'm you know, trying to study uh, Alam Iqbal and I'm new to this and she probably has more knowledge of it than I do. Um, I, don't, I don't see this as Iman than Islam than Ihsan. I, I think that that's one reading of it, which is a useful reading, but I think it's, it's equally important to read it as nurturing Iman, Islam and Ihsan in, at the same time because they're all intertwined and they're all interlinked. The, the, the unique thing about Islam, uh, uh, Islamic education, and the Islamic educational theory and philosophy is that there are so many really deep differing concepts but then they are all related to each other. And it's those relationships between those concepts that help us as educators to sort of build a an educational thought, a framework of thinking about education. And I think Iman, Islam and Ihsan are, are, are you know, these co kind of core concepts that then need to be, we need to understand them deeply, then, but then we need to understand them in relation to how they interact with each other, um, as opposed to like a hierarchy of moving from one to the other. That, that, that's how I would read it, inshallah. I hope that answers your question. Okay, inshallah. I'm going to merge two questions uh, together because they are related. So. Uh, Brother Adnan says, and it's it's in relation to what you said about uh, the way, if we look beyond the past 100 years, um, how, how was education um, conducted? And uh, he talks about the fact that the population was less and that we've got huge populations now. And then how do we serve a large population? And that links in with the question that Brother Shoaib has mentioned, which is 
looking at your model and what I what I put in the chat box is uh, because I think there was a suggestion of it being theory but you Sistify has been running your two schools for the past how long is at least 15 10 15 years and then 15 years plus I think it is 18 um, inch other 18 wow well, mashallah there you go so it is something that's in practice you've got to come to London and Slough to see it in action but um, the question that Brother Shweb is saying is so if the model that you're talking about is in practice or you're trying to put it into practice um, um, how do we then replicate that I suppose to meet the the demand that Brother Adnan's talking about which is actually you can't just educate 50, 60 or, or 100 or 200 or probably 300 which covers your schools I think how do we educate 3 million people? Okay, I, I mean, it's, it's an it's a important question, okay. Um, in the UK, you have an organization called Human Scale Education, okay. They're not a Muslim organization, but they're arguing there's something similar. They're saying that what's wrong with our education systems is that they're, not, they're at a scale that, that does not allow human relationships to develop. So they've formulated a lot of different ways of doing that in large school settings. So they, one thing, for example, that they come up with is vertical form groups, whereby you have a, your form group is um, uh, from different, year, different grades, different year groups. So you have kids who are like from the age of 11 to 16, all in, in, in one group, and they, they stay through the school together. Um, and that then gives a sense of a way of building human, human relationships. Uh, it, one thing that I would say about schooling is that if you look, think about the number of adults you have who are working in schools in the, in the classroom, not, not your ancillary staff, but your teaching staff, and you think about the numbers of children you have and you do some basic sums, it's not that hard to move from one to 30 kids to one to 15. I know in some countries you have one to 50 children, okay, in a classroom. And those, that's to do with funding and resourcing and so on. But when you look at the amount of money that goes into even educational research, okay, the amount of research that's being done on the same topic and the amount of money that we're putting into um, all sorts of different initiatives in education to try and solve this problem, try and solve that problem, try and actually what I genuinely believe is that if you downsize and the scale, scale the groups and create smaller groups, give teachers more time with those kids. So one thing that we do in Shaksia is that teachers stay with the children for two years as opposed to one year. We've done it um, up to three years, even four years sometimes. That's not always possible, but we try and do it at least for two years because what you see is that you know your kids so well after a year that the way that you're able to interact with them in the second year is really different. And by the time you get to the third year, I remember one teacher who was so like, I've been with these kids for two years. Why are you keeping them with me, me with them? You know, for another year, I need a new class. And then by the end of the third year, she said, you know what I achieved this year? I could never have done it otherwise. And that class was an amazing class in the school. It was just happened that we were able to do that. That's a very practical thing. I know at secondary, you don't have that. But then... What, why, why couldn't you possibly do that as secondary? I actually think that the, the approach that we've taken at Shaksia can be done up to the age of 14. At the point of 14, you, it changes because the national system is such that you have to then be sucked into it. But I do believe that we can do quite a bit from you know, age three to age 14. And there's, there, it's about rethinking things. I know that's not possible if, you, if you're in a, already in a system and you're already, um, you know, you've got trustees or governors or you've got a national body, that's oversight and so on. I'm not saying that you can immediately make changes. What I'm saying is that to try and create a movement um, amongst Muslim educators to try and start talking about these things so that we can then, you know, create a demand to say actually these things are important and these changes need to be made and how can we start rethinking that and what does the need for creative thinking and what does the need of like you know um, like what's happening with uh, COVID how how do these ideas sort of feed into these kinds of things so yes there are lots of practical ways of doing it that like we do this in our school to, you know sometimes it's done really well sometimes it's not done so well and it depends on the teacher it depends on all sorts of things but and I can go through that and, you know, we've run courses on it, but it's also the broader discussion of how, what is education, what's it for, and what, how are we going to rethink it, inshallah, which I think is really essential. And Jazakallah Khair to Nidha Trust for um, 
um, uh, organizing these webinars because that's one very important way of, of doing this work. Can I just say that somebody's asking for the um, details, that I think the details of the courses have been shared already from um, on, on the chat. So if you just scroll up, you can probably find that inshallah. Exactly. Thank you so much. Just on the topic of small schools, because that's something that I have been, um, I suppose it relates to some of my own experiences. I started as a secondary school teacher and so far I've been teaching for 17, 18 years now. So the first half was very much secondary. I moved to primary. Um, I suppose one of the reasons why I moved to primary actually is because of my uh, feeling that actually large schools don't work. Um, so I do, I have a belief that large schools don't work. It cannot be right that teachers are teaching two, three hundred children and cannot remember their names. And so if you're teaching children, you can't remember their names. Uh, my personal view is that can't be right. Um, and I found that with smaller schools, yes, primary by, 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 by the nature of their structures are smaller, although some are, some are growing. That personal touch, that personal connection, I found to be a very fulfilling. What I would recommend uh, for the audience members to look at the small schools movement. Google it. There are lots of organizations looking into this. I know that I, I took a trip to the USA uh, 10 years ago uh, to Chicago, looking at some of the chartered schools there. And that follows a similar kind of model of the kind of small schools movement. The idea that you can nurture children's development or young people's development a lot better when the schools are small smaller and I know and Sister Fire is absolutely right um, that larger schools are starting to even though they've got maybe a thousand or two thousand children in their schools they've developed an internal structure where actually you've got four or five schools within large schools and it's in order to develop those smaller kind of nurturing um, structures and you obviously you've had the idea of form tutors etc and form groups for quite a long time and this vertical tutoring is obviously very interesting as well but do look at the small schools movement. Um, it's not, it doesn't mean it's something that can't be scaled up, but the idea, my own personal view here, and you don't need to agree with it, it cannot be right if you're teaching, and this is something that I do, teaching two, 300 children uh, for sometimes 30 minutes, 60 minutes a week, and you not being able to remember their names. I mean, that for me goes against the teacher-pupil relationship where you've got to have a deep connection between between and how can you have a connection with somebody when you've only met them you only meet them for 30 to 60 minutes every week and you can't remember their name anyway uh that's something for you to look uh, for okay there is a, a question i want to scroll back and there is this uh I don't, who is this i can just see the word m so apologies your name starts with m and it says how do people how do people who do not attend islamic school disseminate this through the madrasa evening school now we know that uh, sister uh, Farah, the, the the weekend madrasa has mushroomed, um, as you know, and they become very professional, and they're all almost like um, uh, full-time schools, but they take place on Saturdays and Sundays. How can they adopt whatever you've just said in in that kind of model? Actually, I think that they're doing a much better job than the full-time schools in in some cases, not always, not always. Um, uh, in terms of the madrasa, the core kind of, there are different ways that the principles of Shukse education can be realized, but one of the, the core ways is halakha, okay, is this dialogic halakha that I just mentioned. And to be um, frank, uh, just uh, people who are working in madrasas or maktabs, particularly in the UK, my next project actually is about introducing halakha in a dialogic way in the maktab and madrasa sector. So I'm looking at the moment for about five different schools that I can work with, which you will be given free training, some materials, and it will be a research project. There will be some data collection as, as part of that. But the idea is to bring this format, this pedagogy into the maktab sector and see how it um, emerges, how it changes, if that enables teachers to develop their relationships with the uh, learners and enables teachers to develop shukhsia. Um, so, so that that's something that if anybody's interested, I, I put my email address there. Please please get in touch, and um, we can we can talk about that inshallah. Um, so I think that definitely the way I see it is that we do have to be pragmatic in some ways. We have to work wherever we can and however we can. And what I always say to the the, the children, you know, when when we when I'm talking to them, is that 
Allah has given you a specific situation to live your Islam, right? And as teachers, your, your classroom, your context, your schooling, and he's, even, he's also given you the capacity to be creative. So learn your deen and then be creative of how you live your deen, okay? And as teachers, be creative as to how you can infuse, your, you know, a deeper understanding of your deen into your work, whether you're teaching in a matta, whether you're teaching in a state school, wherever you happen to be teaching. So yes, I think that there's, um, this is a big, big debate. And I think that maybe if, um, there are people who are more specialist on, than I am on this, but we can also look at the classical models of, of, of education. We can look at the models that dominate the UK landscape, South, South Asian models and so on. We can look at why they become, why they are the way that they are, wh how they fit the context of their times and whether, what kinds of changes need to be made for them to meet the context of our times. And we can, th these are, this is a range of work that needs to be done in, in relation to that. Um, so on a simple level, simple answer pragmatically is that yes, by introducing halakha, and halakha is a very traditional form of learning, but, but, but having some proper sort of uh, setup of how you do that um, and using specific pedagogical techniques within it, which are drawn both from Islam, but also from wider um, educational uh, sort of work. Um, that's one very specific way of doing that. Um, there are lots of other things that some maktabs are doing, but I don't want to sort of spend too much time on it. But equally, uh, we also need to celebrate what's already happening in the maktabs and the madrasas that is more in al uh, alignment with Islamic philosophies of education than, than perhaps, you know, sort of the biggest, the, the full-time schooling. Okay, Shukran. thank you so much. Uh, Sister Farah, we have come to the end and I promised myself that we would end by five past uh, five. And so just to mention what, uh, uh, what's coming up next week and the week after, just in case anyone thinks that uh, how long are these weekly webinars going to continue? They're going to continue as long as you stay with us. And alhamdulillah, I think the, the, the uh, number of you that are joining us every week over the past few weeks has exceeded 100 and that's brilliant. So as long as we exceed 100 every week, inshallah, we will continue to go, uh, keep on going. Next week, we are very privileged to have Dr. Nadeem Memon. And I know Sister Dr. Farah mentioned uh, Dr. Nadeem Memon in her presentation. And so he will be joining us next week. Uh, uh, and he will be talking about redefining Islamic environment in Islamic schools. Redefining Islamic environment in Islamic schools. That's going to be a really interesting topic. However, because he is now a lecturer at a university in Australia, he cannot deliver the session at four o'clock because four o'clock our time here in the UK in London is around about the early hours of the morning. So he's going to be delivering his session earlier. And so just for next week, the session is going to be earlier. I believe it's 12 o'clock. Do look out for the advert. It's likely to be 12 o'clock. So for some of you, that might be brilliant because you think, well, actually 12 o'clock is a better time. But just for one week, just for next week, I really wanted to have him. There's a difference between not having him and having him. And I really want to make sure that we have him. Uh, Marshall, we can learn so much from him. And the week after that, just to let you know, we have Sister Asma Klaassen, who's from the Netherlands, and will be talking about pathways to positive identity development amongst Muslim youth. Now, if there, is any, if there are any topics that you would like us to cover that we haven't covered already in the past eight weeks, and uh, please let us know, drop us an email, okay? We are emailing you quite frequently with, uh, with updates, uh, et cetera. Do you reply back and say, can you think about delivering a topic about this? Or perhaps you've got any of your favorite speakers, uh, et cetera, or, 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 or academics, et cetera. We can approach them, we will approach them, uh, inshallah. Okay, so uh, sister, uh, just to thank uh, Dr. Farah Ahmed again uh, for joining us, for really thought-provoking session. I think we're leaving with so many different uh, thoughts and ideas and, uh, and opportunities for further study, uh, inshallah. You've got her email addresses, very kindly given you your, given her not just one email address, but two email addresses uh, for Islamic Saksia and also Cambridge University. I also posted up some of the links to their Facebook and also website. Please do have a look. Please do have a look, um, inshallah, okay? So, um, Jazakum khair again, look after yourselves, keep safe, and we will see you at the same time next week, inshallah. Well, not the same time, at 12 o'clock next week, inshallah. Jazakum khair.
അസ്സാം വരഹമത്തുല്ലാഹി വബർക്കാത്തു